the last six weeks, we've been looking at the gospel. We went through Palm Sunday and, and uh, Resurrection Sunday, and we looked at some of the um, uh, parables of Christ, the parable of the souls that describe the different hearts and how they receive Christ. We looked at uh, wheat and tares, how there are some that are wheat, but some that are false, counterfeit, Christians, tares. Then we looked last week at the treasure, uh, the pearl of great price and the net, talking about they will all be gathered at the end times. Some will receive salvation, some have received salvation, some will be rejected and thrown away because of it. I, I, salvation is the most important event which could ever occur in our lives. And every sermon that I preach <clears throat> should be about salvation, should have the gospel in it. Uh, but so today, what I wanted to do is just kind of take a glimpse forward, and I want us to talk about heaven. Because that's the end result. Um, Jesus said to his disciples before he went to the cross, he said, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, God's house. There are many, depends on how, what translation you have. King James says there are many mansions. There are many rooms. There are many places. But the important thing is, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Personalized place. For you. He knew you in creation. He knew your personality. All of the personalities are different. But he said, I'm going to, if you're my child, I'm going to let you come home. And I will have a place ready for you when you get there. It will be God's greatest gift just to be in heaven in his presence. But he says, I have a place, a perfect place beyond our comprehension. Every time you hear a sermon on heaven, understand that it's going to fall short. There is no way that my words could describe the infinite goodness of God. There is no way that your minds could comprehend and see until we get there. I've often wondered about what my first word would be when I take my last breath here, my first breath there, and the only thing I can come up with is wow. Glory, amen? Because the one thing that we know is we're not deserving of that. And all the dreams that we have down here on earth are basically nothing compared with the gift that God has planned for us from the beginning. It's the most important thing in God's place is to be with Him. And it will all have every attribute of God. So we really don't know everything about heaven. So today what I've taken is a glimpse on one little group of people that, that in the book of Revelation was revealed to John, who wrote it down, about a group of people in heaven. Now, let me put this in context. Anything I preach needs to be in context, right? We don't want to take anything out of context. We want you to beautifully see exactly where it is. The book of Revelation is all future things. Now, when we get to chapter 7, the rapture of the church has already occurred. Jesus has come back for his church, right? Uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be uh, called up. We shall be translated in a twinkling of an eye, and we will go to be, meet Jesus in the clouds, and we'll go to be back, back, back to heaven. Something that the Bible describes as the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, when the church is taken out, Satan will be given a, a moment. I, I can't do all the, the eschatological stuff, so I'm just trying to put it in context where chapter 7 is. Satan will set himself up as, as Lord on this earth. He will have his own Christ and his own counterfeit uh, Holy Spirit called the false prophet. And they will go around and they will set up their kingdom. As a matter of fact, uh, Satan will rebuild the temple here on earth and tell Israel that they can make sacrifice again. But he'll do a bait and switch, and he'll change it, and he won't let Israel bring sacrifice. But he himself will sit upon the throne. Now, if you know your scripture, Daniel said it, book of Revelation says it, that's called the abomination of desolation. He will want to be worshipped as God. 
You must worship Him as God. You must take what is called the mark of the beast. He will then begin to punish anyone who does not follow Him. Now today, if you choose Christ, it's your choice. Anything that we go to go through is incidental to the gift of Christ for us. Even to the place that we would give our life to the one who gave his life for us. But we really don't go through much today. What God wants is us to freely give of ourselves to him and serve him and live for him and honor him and bring him glory. In that day though, if you do serve God, follow God, worship God, you will be enemy number one. So when we get to chapter 7, in the first eight verses of it, you will see that God will seal 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. They will be sealed in protection. Satan will bring all that he can, but that group of witnesses will boldly proclaim the love of God, the witness of Christ. He can't get to them. But to others who hear the message, many will receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Listen to me, church. The gospel works like nothing else. The gospel has not lost its power. The gospel is the only thing that will endure forever. It is God's greatest gift, not given because we deserve it, but simply because He is the Almighty God of love. So by grace through faith, we receive His gift of Himself and His Christ. Now, in chapter 7, the first eight verses talk about the 144 witnesses, 144,000 witnesses that were sealed from anything Satan could do against them. But many more will die. The word that is used is martyred. Okay? By the way, the word martyr means witness. So as they witnessed for God in their own personal testimony and how they... If, you're, if you love Christ, if Christ has changed you, you're going to share that love. That's just what you are. You are a child of God, and you could not be ashamed of the most holy God. And they will be killed. So there is a group that finds themselves in, in heaven before the throne. If you have your Bibles, would you please stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? Starting in verse number 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where do they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. He said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell, with, will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's pray. Our Lord, our God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for who you are, for all the things that you've done. And Lord, I, I pray that in the next few moments that you would let us see what your word has to say, let it 
Speak to our heart. Holy Spirit, make it come alive. May it not be uh, veiled in any way. May your truths come to our heart and may we receive them for your glory, for your honor, and for our benefit. Do it today. Only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? It says in verse 14, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They were saved during the tribulation. They were changed. Today, we go through tribulation, but nothing like what they go through. Look what it says in verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude. How many is that? How much? I don't know either, but there's a bunch of them. There, there is a book in the Bible even called Numbers. Numbers matter. Numbers represent souls. And I don't know who these people, I don't know how many there are. More than you could count. Sometimes the Bible says more than the stars in the heaven, more than the, the, the sand on the seashores, but they're there in unison. Every one of them were saved one at a time, one heart at a time, one invitation, one calling a God at a time. There may be mass numbers of people, but every one of them matter. Everybody matters to God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God is not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. Don't ever say that you don't matter. You matter. God gave His best for you. And it doesn't matter who they are. Look what it says here. It says it very plain. He says, no one could number of all nations, all tribes, all peoples, and all tongues. It's not like there's going to be this section of heaven for this group of people and that section. No, they're one in Christ, and there's only going to be one group of people there, and that was saved by the grace of God. There's not going to be any big shots or any little shots. There's not going to be any uh, uh, superstars over here. No, no, no. Just all wearing the same thing, given the same thing, loved in the same way. What a mighty God we serve. Amen? He says they came from all these different places and they're clothed with white robes. White robes. Standing before the Lord our God. White. Purity. Now, who am I today? Y'all can say it. I'm a sinner. Though my sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Not because of anything that I've done. For by grace are you saved through faith, yet not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works, what we can do. Because if, we did, if it was, we'd be boasting about it. We'd be talking about all the things that we did. We didn't do anything. It was God. God provided salvation fully, totally, completely by Himself. We're just the recipients of it. White robes. Look, those things were, were, were given. They were provided. They were purchased by Christ. And we are sanctified and holy and perfected because of those things. I stand in His presence because of the white robes. It says in, in verse 14, uh, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know, when I get to heaven, I don't want to stand there in my own goodness. I'm not going to brag to God about all the sermons I preached. He's going to say, you called those what? I'm not going to brag about how I kept the commandments. He's going to say, let's talk about the ones you broke. Right? Right? I'm not going to talk about all the good deeds that I've done because he knows everything that I've done. He knows everything that I've thought. Anybody want to come up here and share your thoughts? Anybody be embarrassed to do that? You don't have to be embarrassed in heaven because you'll be clothed in the white robes of glory, cleansed by the blood of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but 
by me. They also have palm branches in their hand. Palm branches. Palm branches represent goodness, come on, and victory. Do you remember when Jesus entered Jerusalem that holy week where he would give his life on Calvary? And the people saw him there and they began to shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They were pledging the goodness of Christ and the victory, which they didn't realize, but the victory that he would provide. And he did provide it on Calvary. Now they are there in the name of the Lord. Maybe they sang victory in Jesus. I don't know. Look what it says in verse 10. And they crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb who provided it. Now, get this real quick. These are people who went through the worst of the worst and because of their faith in Christ, they lost everything and gained even more. They lost everything that had a hold on them on this earth, but they gained everything that God had for them. Now they're clothed in white. They're singing victory in Jesus. They're there because he won and because Satan lost. And in that moment, they worshiped. They worshiped. They worshiped. There is nothing better than to be there when people truly worship. You know, in our world today, we'll say, well, that's worship and that's not worship. When you come from within and you bring what you are, how you love, when you bring that and lay that before God in thanksgiving and praise, that's worship. It's not how beautiful the song is, folks. It's the gift of your heart. We sang this morning, lifting up your hands. We sang gratitude. I want you to hear something. Worship that is true worship is contagious. I never knew what this meant when I was a kid, but they used to say, and let it, let it move from breast to breast. And I'm like, what in the world? That sounded like old King James. I didn't know what that meant. But really what it means is when you worship, it's contagious and the one beside you catches it. And somebody may have a tear that flows. The next thing you know, a hundred have a tear that flows. We're pretty dignified today, but maybe somebody will just shout glory to God. Glory to God. Bradley Elliott was so important to me. Sometime we get in church service and Bradley just couldn't hold it in anymore. And he'd just blow up, right? Now, praise God, he didn't dance. But if he did, it would be with a bodacious stance. But sometimes Bradley just could not contain that was within him. What that was was worship. I've had people say to me, what if I raised my hands in church? I'm saying, so what? I don't care if you raise your hands or you sit on your hands. My dad never did any of that stuff. But I never saw my dad cry any other place other than church. But when the God got a hold of his heart, tears would flow to the place that he couldn't even speak when he was preaching because it was real. There's a lot of things that can help a church to grow. But the number one thing that we need is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit gets, some, gets a hold of some people's hearts, and they begin to express to God their love, the aroma of God fills the room. It doesn't have, it can be in whatever manner, it can be in, you know, whatever type of music, it can be quiet, it can be 
clapping, it can be amens, it can be whatever those are. But I'm here to tell you, when this happened with this group of people who were standing before the throne of God and in front of the Lamb who made it possible, in that day something came out of them that was worshiping God and those that were already there in heaven before, they saw it and it was contagious and it hit them too. Look what it says in verse number 11. And the angels stood around the throne. Now, I don't know what they were, but it, it emphasizes that now they're standing. It's important. <clears throat> and the elders stood around the throne. Or excuse me, the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne, worshiping God. In heaven... One group is standing, praising. Another group falls on their face in humble love and says, Amen, which means it is true, so be it. What these martyred souls were saying, they're saying, Lord, it's right. What they're saying is true. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and, and to the Lamb. So they said, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom Thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. It is true, so be it. Amen. I wish Satan had an ear to hear that. The doomed, damned leader of destruction, who all that he wants to do is divide and conquer, all that he wants to do is to let you feel a little bit of the hate and, and, and fill you with pride so that you would worship your own thoughts and your own ways and your own beliefs rather than, than, than falling before the God who holds these truths. Worship is contagious. So look down in verse number 15. Therefore, it says in verse 15, Therefore, they are before the throne of God. They serve Him day and night in His temple. Oh, Satan's temple's going to be destroyed on earth when Jesus comes back to have what the Bible will call a millennial reign. When Jesus reigns on this earth, what Satan's trying to do, he'll reign for a thousand years. It will be the temple of our God. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Church, let me go quickly. I, I heard a quote this week on, on one of the reels on Facebook. It was uh, uh, Pastor Adrian Rogers. Those of you who know me know how much I, I loved Adrian Rogers. He was, a, he was a man of God. And in this particular sermon, he was saying, what if God were to give you right now Every heart's desire. What if he were to give you everything that you could ever imagine or want on this earth? And you could have it, and you could enjoy it, and you could keep it forever and ever and ever. You could have anything and everything if God would just provide it and just overflow. Most people today would say, that's a good deal. But he, then he said this, but the only thing you would lack is not ever to see the face of God. You see, that's where we have a unbelievable misunderstanding of value. There are things in this world today that we value, that we cherish. I'll be honest, that we covet. How many of you would turn down? I see what I keep, I, what I keep trying to figure out is. When the, when the lottery goes over a billion dollars, how can I win it without buying a lottery ticket? I, I keep looking in the parking lots to see if I can pick up one that somebody's dropped and I can win a billion dollars. How many of you think your life would be changed for the good if you won a billion dollars? What if God offered all of that to you, but you just couldn't be in His presence to see His face? You would be extremely shortchanged. The one thing that 
we all look forward to the most is being in His presence and looking up and saying, Almighty God. I, I woke up this morning in such a good mood. I was tired. My mouth's been dry. But I, I, I just was in the best mood in the world. And a song came to my mind. I was praying and thanking God, and I got my phone, and I told it to, to bring up a, a song that Sandy Patty, I don't know if y'all ever heard her or her not. She was a high soprano. And it's called Almighty God. And I just began my day thanking the Lord who holds the stars in place, who created everything. And there's so much more. Come on. So much more. So much more that He keeps and He holds that is His gift of love for us. And the one who made it possible is my Father and my Lord and my Master and my Savior. What a great day it will be when I see my Jesus. I want a holy hug. I'm going to, y'all know me, I'm going to be a cheerleader when I get to heaven. <laughs> I'm going to do backflips for Jesus. And he is going to, he is going to embrace me. And you know what I'm going to say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And he's going to say, it's okay. My glory will be with you. And I will dwell with you forever and ever and ever. You know, it's like having the birthday party that never ends. Amen? It's like having all the goodness of the Almighty. And He brings it therefore. By the way, therefore they are before the throne of God. Hebrews 4 verse 14 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. He says we can do that now. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. They will serve Him. They will serve Him. I'm not going to just be sitting back going, oh, I love you, oh, I love you, oh, I love you, oh, I love you. Because see, y'all don't like that. Oh, that song repeats itself over and over. Maybe because they did sing, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb, they can put their heart, hand over their heart when they get there and say, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O Lord. Times were difficult on earth. But he says in verse 16, mm, they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. The word shepherd in the Bible means to feed them. Pastor is supposed to be the shepherd. I'm supposed to bring the food of the word of God today so that you can feed on the word of God to feed them. But who will feed those who went through starvation because they wouldn't take the mark of the beast? God will feed them. He will lead them, it says in verse 17, to living fountains of water. They will never thirst again. Everything will be quenched. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. <clears throat> that tells me this, in His presence, nothing will ever, 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 ever bring sadness or separation ever again. Death, no. No. Nothing. Everybody's going to love everybody. Even me. And we're going to get along. How many of y'all hate fussing? <sighs> Evidently, some of y'all love fussing. You've been raising <laughs> me. I love it when we're all in one heart in one accord. God's going to take all the other stuff away. But not everybody's going to have it. Not everybody will be saved. What would keep one from receiving such great salvation? I guess they think they'd have to give up something. Or they would. They'd have to make a trade. They'd have to Trade up, they may think of it as trading down. They may think of it, I have to give up things I don't want to give up. Well, 
everyone in hell would surely trade up. But those that are headed to hell say, oh, not so much. Someone in the service today called me this week. And they said, Pastor, I'm so blessed. I, I can't explain why God, and they kept saying, why would God give someone who's a dirty, rotten sinner like me, why would he give me such love and peace and blessings? I said, it's grace. It's grace. It's not what you do for him. It's what he does through you, in you. And he just kept saying it over and over. Oh, it's just so good. It's just so good. So good that they had to call me and just say, you know, they had that feeling like they were just about to burst. You know, what I should have told them is, that's worship. I guarantee you, God was watching, Jesus was watching, and he was saying, well done, my child. Good and faithful servant. That's a... That's the gift of God for us. I don't know why people want to turn away from it. Sometimes I, I say, I wish you could just open up my heart, Lord, and let them see how truly blessed I am because I do know that everything that I have comes from Him. Many of you understand what I'm saying. Some of you may not. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Our sorrows seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrows will be erased. So faithfully run the race until we see Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. He gave His lifeblood for even me. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're missing it. You don't really understand how much you're missing. But I pray that today you'll hear a still small voice of God that says, I love you. He may show you your sin. That's a great gift. He may tell you that He's not satisfied with that. It hasn't satisfied you yet. Sin thrills, but oh, then it kills. And he'll want to say, if you'll just let me, I'll save you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, what are you waiting for?